right, it is 6.15. I will call the Capital Improvements Commission to order. Um, Chair Sorensen is present. Alderperson Trey Mitchell. Alderperson Grazia Perella. City Plan Commission member Jerry Jones. Sarah Harrison, Nick Dussault, um, ex officio members, uh, Chad Palachek, interim finance director. He's on vacation. Okay. And city engineer, Ryan Sazma. Here. All right. For those um, in attendance, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for all. Right. Is there a motion to approve the minutes from May 20th or May 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 4th, 2020? Is there a second? All right. There's been a motion and second. Any discussion on the minutes? Seeing none. All those in favor, please state aye. Anyone opposed? Chair votes aye. The minutes are approved. All right, jump into 3.1, RO number 12122, submitting capital improvements program, request for the years 2022 through 2026. And I will turn it over to our city administrator for his presentation. City administrator, take it away. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, everybody. We're gonna talk a little bit about our 2022 uh, to 2026 capital improvements program presenting today. Uh, please understand that this is a little bit different than past capital improvements meetings. Um, instead of having 50 or 60 items to go through and vet and rate them and figure all of that out, what we did is we met with all of the department heads and we vetted everything down to, uh, you know, basically what the expectations are, what are, what are the needs for the departments, looking at the return on investment for projects, making sure that we have the best presentation for you guys to review. So, moving forward, next. One of the, one of the points that I wanted to uh, continue to bring up, and I brought this up in my state of the city, was our four priorities. So if we look at our four priorities, as you've heard me talk in the past, our number four is our roads. We have over 200 miles of roads. It's our one, number one con uh, city constituent uh, concern, and it's something that is our largest asset that we need to, to focus on. Number three is obviously our infrastructure, buildings, and ERP. And again, we have multiple facilities, millions of dollars worth of value, and we need to make sure that we're managing them and maintaining them um, for years to come, just like we did here with City Hall. Number two is our fleet. And when we talk about our fleet, we're talking about our cars, trucks, our you know, snow plows, our garbage trucks, everything down to the squad cars. And we are in the process of a fleet management program that has come to council. So that's going to take a, a huge burden off of our capital, um, our, our general obligation debt in the future um, by taking that off. And our number one asset is our employees. And that's something that we need to continue to invest in, but that'll be for future meetings. Next. Capital improvements strategic plan is part of our is our is part of our, our continued stairs core values. So when we talk about that, our and I keep referencing it to make sure that we keep putting it in the forefront. It's you know focusing on our our service, our teamwork, our accountability, our innovation, our respect to one another, and our stewardship and fiscal responsibility, which we're going to be talking a lot more in a few minutes, next. So when we talk about capital improvements program, or CIP, we've, we're doing a little bit of a, a focus shift. So we're, in, we're gonna encompass our strategic plan, our core values, our long-term vision, shifting projects when necessary to maximize funding sources. That is something that's a little bit new. It's being more strategic, not just in today's needs and tomorrow's needs, year over year and how we space them out. We're gonna integrate 
our inter interdepartmental uh, synergies, again, using resources within our departments, whether it's engineering um, or you know, financial, it's, it's using everybody's uh, talents. Maintaining affordable levels on geo debt, general obligation borrowed funds, and you've heard me talk about that, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. And continued focus on our street and infrastructure and how we're going to implement that into the future um, general obligation debt. And integration of our planning for future TID closures. Again, balancing closures with large facility projects. So we're looking at our process and defining it more strategically. Next. So when we talk about our, our long-term vision, it's shifting projects when necessary to maximize funding sources, utilizing state, of the, state and federal grant funds. And again, we've done a great job of that. And we're continuing to look at op, um, opportunities for grants. We also know that there's potential for additional funding in the future with a, a proposed infrastructure uh, plan with the state and federal government. So we'll see how that's gonna affect us. And we also have our American um, Rescue Plan um, funding. So there's opportunity there when it comes to wastewater, water, and broadband expansion. So there's, there's funding there. And that that's a reference to the 22.8 million that the city has been blessed with. Uh, working with community partners, again, synergies, ensuring workable timing and access during uh, project completion. And then again, vetting projects to balance urgency and capacity. We worked really hard with the departments and to better understand what the needs were, what the wants were, and in figuring out how can we look at this, not like in the years past for some of us that have been on capital improvements and kicking the can down, but how can we accomplish the needs for today and tomorrow fiscally responsible? Next. So when we talk about capital improvements uh, to integrate in departmental synergies, we looked at global, global view of the city's infrastructure resources, needs and capacity. We also looked at uh, strategically managing ongoing maintenance, replacement and buildings, equipment and infrastructure. Again, we're planning to have a better program for the future, not just fix what's broken today, but what is, what's coming, what's gonna happen. And that's also gonna be affected by um, what you guys have heard me talk about, uh, the EAM program, that module is going to help us to better control this. Prioritizing needs, again, the enterprise asset management, and that system will also uh, allow us with our ADA um, compliance audit. And just to remind everybody that the ADA compliance audit is something that we have to continue to spend money on, otherwise we can get ourselves as a city into trouble. There's a lot of ADA deficiencies that we need to continue to focus on. So it's a priority for us to continue to invest in that area throughout the city. Utilizing internal SMEs, subject matter experts, we have a vast knowledge of experts that, are, that we're blessed with in our department heads and our team and staff. So we need to use those resources. We also need to pool our resources. Again, synergies between departments build economies of scale, maximize the cost savings. Again, purchase as a group, not as an individual. Next. Capital improvements, st uh, strategic uses of fund balance. Previous uh, capital improvements focus, geo debt funds as main funding source. Again, we always talk about geo funding and that's about it. There's other ways to get, this, to get the, the, the dollars. Strategic use of fund balance. Again, this is one of the options that we have. Moody's investors service, con uh, service consideration. Motor vehicle information uh, technology fund, internal budgetary increases, support ongoing infrastructure upgrades. Again, we're using different synergies, charging each department for additional um, processes like our IT. IT funds itself because each department has to pay for that benefit. So this way everybody is supporting the needs of, the, of our IT. One of the things I did wanna mention was during our last call with uh, Moody's was that when we talked about our strategic plan that I presented to council on our geodet borrowing, 
they were very, very impressed with the fact that we have developed a plan for the future, staying within a certain, um, a certain scale. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Next. So when we look at capital improvements, general funding and fund balance history, I just wanted to kind of touch on this to help everybody understand. As you can see in the chart, and according to our GASB rules, 54, we, have, we, we the city of Sheboygan, have decided to follow that where we, we basically have a minimum of 25% of general fund. So in 2017, our actual needed to be 8 million 778,000, but we had 68% in there. So when you look at that, we actually had 20 million, almost 21 million in rounding, significantly. So if you think of the blue area, I call that the mattress, right? Where you, you hide your money so your parents don't find it or something. But that money is basically the minimum that we wanna keep, it's for that rainy day fund, but we had 20 plus million in there, almost 21 million. That's a lot of money that we're still going to the bank and borrowing money for, for projects. To me, that's not a good steward. You look at 2018, it drops. Why did it drop? We did city hall renovation. We took five million out of general fund to help us so that we only borrowed six and a half million towards the remodel. That is something that's approved by Moody's. That's, that's a good use of general fund. Within a year, 18 to 19, you can see that we, we, we bumped right back up from 17 million plus to 19 million within a year. Again, this is because of the amount of money that is overflowing into the general fund year over year. In 2020, we actually, according to our, our, our recent audit, we're gonna be hitting $23 million in general fund. We only need to have in there 9.8. So we're 61% where we need to be. To me, again, I want the, I want the group and the council and, and, and the capital improvements group to understand we have money that we should be using versus borrowing, which goes back to what I had talked about in borrowing with, um, to the council earlier. So when we look at uh, 2021, we were estimating 21 million and that's because I'm going to be asking that we're going to use some general fund to help finance some of our borrowing. So we're not being good stewards of general fund, in my opinion, when, when we have so much money in the mattress, as I call it. Next. So CIP maintained steady use of geo debt funds, geo debt usage, increased, increased cost to the city's debt payment over time, Again, part of my operating cost is being able to pay, pay that debt back, kind of like paying that credit card. We've got, a, we've got a credit card debt, using that analogy. We've got a, we have to keep making those payments. We can't keep borrowing more money because the, my loan debt continues to increase when we've got a, a mattress full of money. So my goal is to limit geo debt funds, making the city's debt payments affordable, repayment schedules, that are aggressively managed, maintain our AA2 rating, which we still have. It was confirmed in March of 2021. Moody's Investors Service supports the city's present debt management plan presented on March 2021. Next. This is the plan that I had presented to council and, and to the finance department. And if you remember, for those that were in, included, the different colors represent different borrowing strategies or models as I call them. So when we were looking at the blue, that was what we were looking at as far as um, borrowing 4 million with no refunding. The orange was the 4 million borrowing with refunding. And then the green, which was what we ended up, um, which is what we ended up doing, which is geo debt, 2 million borrowing with refunding. So the black line is the tax levy revenue and G for geo debt. The purple line at the top is the 2021 budget, other revenues sources for geo debt. Again, that's assuming all of the revenues come in 
as planned. We all know that we're, in this, we're still in a pandemic. We all know that it's gonna be lower than that. So the estimated is the dashed line, which is still a scary line. So we, we really wanna be below that dashed line, right? So by looking at the green, by doing the two million and then other funding, that keeps us well below the dashed line. So if we continue the course and we continue to have some issues with revenues in the next year or two, to me, sticking with this plan is the best plan for a good stewardship. Next. So next, capital improvements continued focus on street infrastructure repair and replacement. So as you're gonna see in a few minutes, our street repair uh, community survey tops resident request um, for the past five years. 2009 to 2010, less than one mile, one mile, that's what? A very short period of time when you think about it. It's a short distance. Less than one mile of street repairs and replacements was completed at that time during 2009 and 2010. Since 2017, strategic plan creation through 2021, 25.87 miles of street repair, replacement com uh, were completed as planned by 2021. Please understand that the actual dollar figure would be substantially increased because some of the, the projects that you guys remember, like North Avenue, Superior Avenue, they weren't large miles of roads being done. They were actually high dollars because these were very large intersections and plans accordingly. So when we talk about 25 miles, um, that's, that's amazing. Our 2022 to 2026 CIP, we're planning for an additional 16.4 miles of street repair and replacement that Director Bebo will talk about in a few minutes. Next. So our 2022 to 2026 capital improvements program, as you guys can find in here, we want to focus on the 22, and then we and because that's what we're actually we're actually asking you guys to to review, ask questions, and approve. And please understand that moving forward, our plans will be more strategic. But if we approve everything that we we put forward in our 2022 plan. I'm not asking you guys to vet all of it and, and you don't need to go through and say, this passes, this fails, um, let's not do this, let's not kick the can down the road anymore. The plan that, I, that my team and I are putting together is that with the two million geo debt and the million $45,000 of general fund balance usage completes everything 100% that we've put together in the 2022. And I'm very proud to be able to say that we can do everything that we need to do for 2022 without having to have you guys go through and try to figure out which is more important. And to me, strategically, and being fiscally responsible for the city of Sheboygan, using $1,045,000 is nothing in the big picture. Thank you. All right, thanks Administrator Wolf, appreciate that. Any questions from elders for Administrator Wolf or from committee members? All right, now we'll jump into department presentations. First, we'll kick it off with um, Chad. So the Department of City Development just has one project in 2022, and this project has been around for a few years, and this is the Indiana, Indiana Avenue Trail Project. Um, you'll recall that the city uh, had an, has an agreement with Union Pacific Railroad to purchase right away along Indiana Avenue, basically from Pacifico out to 13th Street, and then from Indiana Avenue down to Union Avenue. So the plan is to extend the Shoreland 400 trail um, from Pennsylvania down to Pennsylvania Avenue down to Union Avenue. So it would pretty much span the entire length of the city. The difference, so in the 2022 plan, we have 875,000 uh, budgeted for purchase. We'll see if we get there. Um, Union Pacific is at 1.2 million and the city is at 875,000. 
and we continue to negotiate with them when they expect us to be paying for our street right away that we already own. So that's where the difference is. The city attorney's office continues to negotiate um, with them. So we're optimistic that at the end of the year's end, we're gonna get to an uh, agreement that both parties can agree to and we can move forward and purchase the right of way. So this would be uh, primarily funded with TID 17 dollars, uh, TID 17 capital projects fund, as well as some uh, potential for some state grants and some funding through the community development block grant program. So this would not affect, this project would not affect the general fund. Um, would be primarily funded through other sources. All right, thanks, Chad. Any questions for Chad? All right, thank you. We'll go to transit. Derek? Am I on? Cool. Well, I just want to say uh, thank you. Uh, this is probably the easiest uh, capital presentation I've had to give in my nine plus years here, so I credit uh, the committee, uh, Alder Wolf, who a long time transit commission chair, uh, sorry, city administrator Wolf, I've still got that in my head, um, for his long, uh, long support of our uh, projects in the transit commission. Um, for 2022, uh, there are no projects being presented for the parking utility. I was convinced to push those off. Um, just kidding. Um, but transit, I've, uh, <laughs> I'm very fortunate enough uh, to announce that uh, we will be replacing 10 uh, fixed rail buses in our 2022 uh, project list. Um, <clears throat> this has uh, been actually a very unique uh, process to get these funded. So I'll just review that five of them um, are going to be uh, funded uh, through what is called the CMAC or uh, Conjunction Mitigation Air Quality Control Grant. Um, we also will get one extra bus uh, through a federal uh, section 5339 bus and bus facilities grant. And then uh, four, which um, will not be borrowed for, but will rather be funded through a reduction in uh, shared revenue, uh, are gonna be funded through the recent uh, Volkswagen mitigation uh, program that is offered through the state of Wisconsin. Um, each bus uh, comes in at a cost of around $460,000 for the federal programs. 20% will be city responsibility and 80% funded through federal grants. Uh, with the uh, VW buses, 20% uh, will be funded locally through that shared, reduc shared revenue reduction with 80% funded through the Volkswagen program. Uh, with the replacement of these 10 buses, it will put our fleet for, I believe the first time, uh, under useful life completely at 100%, which um, if you look forward, you do not see another bus replacement on the next five-year capital plan. So thank you. Do I, anybody have any questions? Administrator Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. Derek, I just wanted to compliment you and your team with the fact that as, as you did state, and I just wanna make sure that the committee uh, heard this, is that this will be the first time that the city of Sheboygan will actually have a full fleet of brand new buses and it's not costing the tax taxpayers um, you know geo debt basically or additional cost um, I I remember when I first got involved back in 2011 with transit we were we were buying used buses just to get by so this is a great great um, opportunity for the city and for your team so thank you for everything you do thank you city administrator wolf for those comments <laughs> Any other questions for Derek? All right, thanks Derek. Thank you. Move on to IT, Derek. Good evening, we will start with the cable TV capital plan. So for cable TV in 2022, we have 25,000 for a TriCaster. Um, then we go pretty silent until 2026, which we'll be looking for uh, 50,000 to replace the uh, broadcast truck. Going to IT, in 2022, we have 25,000 for uh, IBMI or AS400 application retirement. And if you look at the capital plan, you'll see that repeated in 23, 24, and 25. There's dollars out there. Our intent is to hopefully be off that by the end of 2023, but we're, we're We'll see where we're at. And then in 2026,
we'll start to see the need for some technology refreshment or refreshing again. Um, we spent a fair amount in 2019 and 2020 on technology. So that'll be five, six years old at that point and we'll be looking at uh, refreshing it. Thanks, Eric. Any questions for Eric? Right, thank you. Roberta? I would just like if, if the um, presenters could tell us what page of the document or Mr. Mayor, if you could, because if, if we want to take notes, it's just easier for us to find them. You were page 65 and 66. Did everyone hear that request? Just when you're going Please. through the project, just refer and reference the page number in the book. So. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next on is police department chief. I see that you're online here. Good evening. So our program is pretty simple. Um, the majority of it is made up of replacing vehicles. Uh, for those that are new, um, our replace, essentially what we're doing is following a replacement plan that we've worked on over the last um, 10 or 15 years um, to smooth out costs and make sure that we're um, replacing vehicles when it's most advantageous, advantageous to us based on um, warranty and repair costs. So our marked vehicles we replace currently on a four year replacement schedule. So they're getting to 100,000 miles and the warranty is, is up at that point. So that's when it's most advantageous to replace those vehicles. All the other unmarked vehicles are replaced on a 10 year replacement schedule at, at this point. Occasionally we may move one of those vehicles off a year, um, again, just to smooth or even things out. So our projects for 2022, we have five marked vehicles that we're replacing. Um, as part of that request, we're making two of those vehicles, hybrid vehicles, so that we can um, see how those work out and test them for the first, first, first time, and then decide how to include those in our plan going forward. There's a request for one, uh, I'm sorry. So those are on page 29. The next one is a request for an, to replace an unmarked vehicle. That's on page 30. And then on page 31 is our other project for 2022, and that's to um, update and seal and resurface our parking lot. So it's recommended that parking lot be um, resurfaced and sealed after about eight or 10 years. The, the parking lot was um, constructed in 2009, um, so it, it needs some work. There's um, some sealing especially that needs to be done and there's one area that actually needs to be um, dug out and some gravel um, put back in and then uh, a patch put over and then, then resurfacing done. So we've worked on that um, with DPW. Um, they'll be doing the work for us. Um, and so that's an important project for us next year. Um, then going forward, our 2023 projects are on page um, 74 through 76 um, and that's again replacing um, marked vehicles and then there's two additional projects in there um, one is the police range remediation and so the police department has a range at wastewater treatment plant um, it has not been remediated and so it does need um, some work um, cleaning out um, the lead that's in there and then rebuilding some of the berms and, and patching that. And then the other project um, that's in there is for maintenance at the police facility. Um, and at this point, I would call that a placeholder as we're working with DPW um, on developing a plan that they can assist us with really in putting a, a, a more thorough maintenance program in place at the police department. And so what we can work into our operating budget um, over the next year going forward, we're gonna do that. But the, the project that's in there would recover, would cover uh, replacement of desks and work areas at the front desk and um, in the supervisor's office. So two areas that a lot of people are in all of the time at the front desk um, with going to joint dispatch, that, that area is done differently 
So there's different workflows um, that we really need to, to look at and see how we can better configure that area for the work that's being done there. 2024 projects are on page 113 through 115. Um, those are again replacement of vehicles um, to include uh, a patrol wagon. So we have one paddy wagon. It'll be 20 or 21 years old at that point. Um, and so again, we put it in there as a placeholder at this point, but it's going to be needed to be replaced at some time. So that's where we're predicting at this point would be the best time. But as we go forward, we'll continue to evaluate that. 2025 is uh, on page 149 to 151. And again, those are re just replacement of vehicles, marked vehicles and unmarked vehicles. And then in 2026, we're on page 180 through 182 and we're asking to replace um, three unmarked vehicles no, I'm sorry. Five marked vehicles, two unmarked vehicles, and then we put our in, impound area improvements on there. And so that's uh, a big project that is there um, at this point for a placeholder, but to make sure that it's on um, everybody's um, radar and is aware of it. And so what we're asking for there is to, to move our impound area, which is currently at DPW, onto our bar back parking lot area uh, behind the police department. And so last year we expanded the parking for the police department behind the, the um, police department by purchasing that, that land from the county. Um, and then to really um, create efficiencies um, for both us and DPW, the long-term plan is to, is to move that uh, impound area and evidence storage area from DPW onto our property so that we can connect that to the building and, and make things um, uh, just more efficient uh, for both us and to give that space back to DPW. So those are the projects that we have at this point and I would be willing to answer any questions at this point. All right, any questions for Chief Domagowski? Roberta's rubbing her hands together. Is that a no? All right, thanks, Chief. Um, next, we'll go to the fire department. Um, just a quick, I guess, quick as Chief Montiano comes up here, just a question for the committee members: um, Do you want the department to go through every single year, or just 2022? I don't know if there was a preference, or if now we can just stay focused on 2022. And the the, re, the the point for the question is the fact that there are a lot of things, a lot of projects. Um, in 23, 24, 25, 26. And then I, I just don't want the committee to get uh, confused because some of the, the borrowing and the, the actual uh, use of funds can be a little bit cloudy. Um, that's why I'd rather stick with the 22 because that's really what, what we're looking to get approved and not muddy the water. So if it's okay, I would ask our department heads to only go over the points of, for 2022 that we're asking to be approved. Thank you, Chief. Sure, th sure thing. <laughs> All the work I put into it, no, I'm just kidding. Well, uh, good oh, you're evening. you're just gonna ask so for another I fire do, truck, right? I do have, <laughs> you look nice today. Uh, <laughs> as soon as Scott gets it uh, crossed over, I'll be, it should be hooked up. All right, well, we'll do it without the PowerPoint. Uh, <laughs> So really, there, there's three items that we're requesting, so uh, we'll make this quick. Um, we're requesting a uh, station three design, uh, architectural study design phase of our headquarters station, station three. This was actually in the budget for a three phase system for this year, starting phase one, replacing a lot of the mechanicals. However, after looking at the building, walking through with architecture with DPW uh, and, and the administrator, it was felt that we should look, instead of putting money into a, I don't wanna say failing, but a, a building that's not gonna last, uh, save that money and use it smartly and wisely. And that's where we got, uh, wanted to go forward with a uh, phase, uh, architectural study. So that's what that $250,000 is. 
The second thing we're requesting is an ambulance replacement. We currently have four ambulances in our fleet. Uh, they, they were purchased back in uh, 2016. Uh, they were all the same. Um, and uh, currently, it's over, they're, they're getting old. They're, they're, they're only supposed to be frontline five to seven years. So truly, when they were purchased, we started our ambulance service, obviously, back in 2012. We, they were purchased, they were refurbished in 2016, which is putting a new body on, the, or the new chassis, on, and using the same patient compartment. Our, our, uh, all the vinyl, the walls, the cabinets are falling apart. They're not, not, they're not safe anymore. So we need to start getting them on a rotation. And one last thing you don't want, you don't want to do is you don't want to buy all the ambulances at, at once. So we'd like to start moving towards getting them on a rotation. So this would be the first purchase to get our reserve as a fleet in our fleet and then start rotating the next couple of years. And then you wouldn't have to buy another ambulance for four to five years, six to seven, depending on wear and tear. And the final thing we're requesting at the fire department is a replacement of our engine. Uh, the NFPA standards recommend keeping an engine in frontline status for 10 years and moving it to reserve status for five years and then replacing it. This engine that we're requesting to replace is over 25 years old. So again, we've kicked that can continuously down the road uh, it's time to get a replacement. It, it, we're spending anywhere from five to ten thousand dollars annually just to maintain it, and then every time we use it, it seems something else is happening, and we just keep putting the band aids on. So uh, that's it for the two, three years. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer. But uh, I hope you enjoyed my PowerPoint too. It was <laughs> well put together. <laughs> Thanks, Chief. Questions for the fire chief? All right, next we'll uh, jump into DPW. We'll start with uh, buildings and traffic first. Well, first we'll start with David Beaver, so. I'm gonna make an attempt to see if it, uh, we'll power up and get onto the screen for everybody this evening. So thank you for this opportunity for us to uh, present the, the capital improvements projects focusing specifically on, on 2022. And uh, I just want to introduce the DPW team that has been hard at work. Uh, I'm going to start with Superintendent of Parks and Forestry, Joe Curlin. Uh, next to him would be Mike Wilmus, Superintendent of Facilities and Traffic. Also this evening joining me is Kevin Jump, assistant with the city engineer as project manager with our civil engineering department. Uh, next to him is Don Sokolowski, business manager. Behind uh, is Rick Nye, he's our supervisor of our motor vehicle division, manages all the vehicles and equipment for the department. And also behind me uh, in the gallery is introduced earlier is Ryan Sazma, our city engineer. We're gonna focus first of all on the facilities and traffic. And what, what I'd like to do is, uh, instead of going by page by page, what I'd like you to do is focus on the summary spreadsheet because I'm gonna go right down the list. So if you go to the sheet that I'm going to It's a page of the spreadsheets, the ones that pull out, it's the first one. And you'll see ex expenditures, city buildings near the bottom. And uh, the first project that we're looking at is uh, at our municipal service building, our headquarters, right on New Jersey Avenue, drop off site. Maybe that will, a lot of people will think, connotate with that, but that's basically our headquarters. It manages all the departments that we mentioned here this evening. Uh, we have a generator in there that is original to the building. It's over 50 years old. That is going to be scheduled to be replaced or later this year. As well as with this project, we need to upgrade all of the electrical panels 
and that will service and tie in with the new generator. So that's what uh, this project we're looking at, and that's roughly 195,000. In addition, in 2022, we're looking at upgrading our vehicle wash, wash bay. And again, this is original to the building. So as you can see, the vehicles and equipment 50 years ago weren't nearly the size of what we're dealing with today. Uh, and some of the pictures which you'll see here is we're barely able to get one of our salters and plow trucks within the bay to wash it out, clean it out. As you can imagine, uh, this is very important. That type of operation after we have to thoroughly clean the vehicles. As you can imagine, salt is very corrosive to the vehicles and it reduces their life expectancy. you can see. So what we're looking to do is take one of the walls, expand it so we have much more room to access this area and better, better ability to maintain our equipment. Those are the two main projects for 20. David? David? Yes. I just wanted to also point out uh, for the committee to, under, to also understand when you look at the, the Salter, um, you're also going to have a, a uh, an above area for cleaning for safety. Cor correct. Right. One of the one of the difficulties as well is we're not able to get above the equipment. We don't have a, a, a current walkway or any method. So. <clears throat> Quite frankly, we'll tip the boxes up within the building as best as we can and try to spray out as much as we're able to. The new system will actually have a stairwell, a walkway to traverse the entire length of the vehicle, be able to spray from the top to clean effectively and as well safely. Thank you for reminding me of that. I want to skip the rest of these projects for the future years for the building this is. Very important, but there is a plan. So one of the other plans, and this has been in, in the capital improvements for several years already, and what it is is it's a systematic upgrading of our city street lighting network. We have a variety of different types of street lights, as you can see, that uh, uh, Mike Wilmis has provided in his presentation this evening. We have some candy canes. We have the the Lumex, which we call the white kind of lights that are, are standard along the, our, our marina and lakeshore area and our ornamental lights, as well as our Lumex, which are mainly on our thoroughfares. What we're doing is we're re, instead of replacing the lamps, we're actually upgrading and retrofitting many of these existing fixtures with LED uh, la lamps. Tremendous energy savings and improved lighting in terms of light quality and lumens projected. So again, this is a citywide update. It's an annual program that is in the, in, 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 in the program. Similar to it, we do traffic signals as well. And uh, that's also part of the, the presentation. We try to pick a, a, a signal that we can, uh, intersection for instance, that is older, uh, needs to be upgraded either with the proper poles, trans, uh, trombone arms that extend over for, for turn lanes and such. And again, it's an annual program. We have roughly 45 intersections that are signalized with traffic signals. And slowly we are systematically upgrading them, getting up, up to standard and fixing, fixing them as well. That's the majority of our facilities and traffic uh, portion. Following along, and I'm going to go right uh, along with this, is street, right? Yep. This is the biggest part of, part of the program, uh, as, as you can imagine. One of the things I think everyone, the commissioner, should have received tonight is a PDF of a city map detailing the work that has been performed roughly since 2013 and, and, and on. And that, those are the solid lines on the city, city map in front of you this evening. The dashed lines represent future projects within the next five years. 
there's been a lot of narrative over the years about how terrible our streets are and we gotta do something, we have to do something. What I'm trying to tell you is there's been a tremendous amount of progress. As City Administrator Wolf indicated this evening and earlier in his presentation, there's been a tremendous amount of work. Yet when you have 200 miles of, sh of streets, we're always gonna find one that still needs to be repaired. So what, we, what we're trying to do is trying to change that narrative that Sheboygan streets are, are terrible and we've got to do something. Actually, we have been doing quite a bit. And what we need to do is continue that reinvestment. If you remember in, in, in Administrator Wolf's presentation earlier in 2008 and 2009, we hardly did even a mile of streets. Well, back then, you know, if you, it was fine. You didn't see it right away. But over time, that disinvestment that neglect of not investing shows up five, 10 years down the road. And that's where we are, you know, with recently. And since then, we've really been concentrating and reinvesting in our local infrastructure. And uh, again, as of 2007, our city streets were right around 6.6 .6 on an average scale, one being low, 10 being high. So 6.6 .6 was our rating, average rating. We dropped down in 2013 down to 5.9. So there was a slow deterioration of our overall rating over our old, old network. Since then, since 2013, as of 2019, we've been able, with the work that has been done on, on the map to date, the average street rating is actually at 6.25 as of 2019. This year, 2021, we re-rate the streets. We rate them every two years. And we're fully anticipating after the work that the department has completed, our rating should be above 6.3. We're actually projecting a right around 6.4. We wanna to get to that 6.6, .6, which, which we're looking at as our benchmark, was when we started this whole rating back in 2007. So we're getting there, we're making progress, and I think that as commissioners, as an older persons, and as leadership of the community, everyone's been part of this slow but steady improvement of our city street network. Director Beeble. Yes. Could you um, just real quickly define what the pacer is? When you reference the number 6.6 .6 and stuff like that, the, the committee may not understand what that actually means. So yeah, um, just w pull that up real, here, real quickly for you. So again, s streets rated on a scale. The scale is one would be very poor, a number 10 would be very good. And so there's a range. So we rate our streets on that 10 scale. And based on, based on that network, we come up with an average rating. And, and again, what we're trying to do with the program is if we reinvest our, our, the dollars, for instance, on some of what we would say are good streets, the, the cost to repair a, a, a good working condition street is much lower cost than waiting for a street to degrade to the point where it has to be reconstructed. And, and Administrator Wolf mentioned this before, you know, we always go, we always want to see how many miles that we've repaired. And that's, that's easy to contemplate, but it's not always the best measure of the use of the dollars because when we reconstructed North Avenue, that was complete removal and replacement of curb and gutter, pavement, sidewalks, brand new street lighting. There were some utilities in there that had to be upgraded as well. When you do a project like that, that project was roughly $5 million for less than a mile, a little less than a mile. Now, when we go in and we resurface a street that maybe, let's say, is a five or a six rating, it's still pretty good. It's got a little rough ride to it. But if you resurface it, it's much, much, much less expensive. You're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars versus millions of dollars. So the more that we can time our maintenance early and on some of our, what I would say, better streets, we're able to, do, we're able to spread that out more evenly and have a larger impact on our overall rating. And, and it sustains it at a higher level. 
we always will have those streets that need to be reconstructed. That it, it's just inevitable. A street gets beyond its point where it can no longer be maintained and resurfaced. It needs to be reconstructed. That happens. But we want to minimize that going forward. We want to, if we're able to continually, on an annual basis, continue with a good program, we should be able to minimize that as well as maximize any opportunity for federal dollars in the future. If you'd like, I can go. I, 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 I don't want to belabor the point. I think you'll, you'll, you can go down the list. You, the streets that we've identified, we use a couple of factors. We use the, their pavement rating. We look at as well as the, the, the condition of the pavement. We also look at the vehicles that travel that street. And there's a balancing act here. We'll, we'll look at a street such as a North Avenue that will be resurfaced. That, that street has 8,000 vehicles a day on that section. Now we'll look at a similar street that has the same pavement rate. Let's say that's a pavement rating of four. If we look at another street that has a pavement rating of four, such as, uh, I, I've, with, just a street, I guess, uh, say, let's say, uh, Rolling Meadows. It probably has 300 vehicles a day. So we have a much larger impact when we concentrate on some of our arterials that are in worse condition because the majority of users of that street are going to receive that impact and that benefit. Needless to say, though, we cannot ne neglect and turn a blind eye to our neighborhoods, so we, we do a balancing act. And what we look at is how do we reinvest in some of our neighborhoods? And we've used, through Chad Pelishek's department, community block grant funds. And we've been able to leverage that and use that as investment to upgrade our neighborhoods and have an impact on what I would say in some of our, not necessarily high travel districts, but yet it's, it has a direct impact on the quality of that neighborhood. It's unfair for neighborhoods to be disproportionately affected by bad roads it, it's just going to be a, a further burden on that neighborhood. The, the more we can balance that and have an impact on those neighborhoods by using these programs to leverage that and using some of our own DPW labor as well to do some of those smaller projects, we're able to spread these types of projects out. And I think when you look at the map, if you look at, our, at, our, at the, the big map of the city, I think there's a nice balance in the mix on there. You see some high traveled arterials, but you'll also see many, many neighborhood streets as well. And I think the dash lines also represent the future. And they also represent that there is a, an investment that will be occurring in, in these neighborhood areas as well. Is there any questions on anything about the streets main, uh, resurfacing management program? or a specific project that you may have. Otherwise, I, um, I'm sure the data is all in front of you and uh, it's pretty self-explanatory in terms of which street is being proposed. Any questions for Director Beeble? No, awesome, thanks David. I'm gonna jump into parks then. We're gonna go to parks next, yes. I'm going to pull that up shortly. Oh boy, I got too much open. So again, Joe Curlin, Superintendent of Parks and Forestry, and Tim Bull, our city forester. One of the big things that, that I'm sure we're all aware of or you've heard is the emerald ash borer. Invasive species affecting uh, our emerald, our, our ash trees. Our ash trees just alone in the city of Sheboygan is probably over 6,000 between street trees and in within the parks. Uh, it's been a tremendous challenge and uh, a great testament to our Forestry Division. They've been at this for five years and they've really attacked this, this program to the, to the point where we're 
almost done either treating or affecting those ash trees, and now we're really gearing up to replant and reforest the community. And that's the exciting part. It's not always fun when, you, when all you're doing is concentrating on cutting, 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 trying to get ahead of it. And uh, a testament to the team, they've done a great job. So what we're looking at, this is also kind of an annual program within the capital improvement. So there's an earmark in there, roughly 110,000, of which the, it gets broken up. We have tree planting. We're looking at around 600 to 700 trees. We still have tree removals, which was there's a portion that gets contracted because there's just too many. For We have four full-time personnel on our forestry department. Four. And that's about 15,000 roughly trees along the streets. But that means trimming trees. That means planting trees. That means removal trees. There's a lot of other activities that they need to do other than just the Admiral Ash Borer. That is a constant. So... Same thing with stump grinding. Stump grinding is very uh, labor intensive and it takes time. So here's some, of the, some pictures that I want to show you. Of, there's 264 trees on the removal list as of April 26, 2021. Right now we have 264 trees that need to be removed. Some of the activity, they're not easy. They're not just going out there and just, you know, felling it into the street and taking care of it. There's power lines, there's homes, there's broken limbs, and in determining where, where that is leaning, it takes time. Here's a, just a before picture with some of the ash trees. You can see how the, the top of it is just almost no leaves left. We had a big removal project in there. And um, again, cleaning out. It's kind of sad how, how wide open after the forest and some of the urban forest is removed. We talked about trees, but then we've done so many tree removals, we're falling behind on tree stumps. We have over a thousand tree stumps that need to be ground out, replaced, and retop soil and, and, and ready for a new planting in the future. That, Again, this is the tr we're tr trying to give you a picture of the enormity of the, the job that is in front of our department. We still have 2,400 trees that we're trying to save. We're actually treating them on a, Tim, correct me, Ryan, every two-year basis? Three, every three years, thank you. So every three years, we do a rotation, but they get treated, and we're trying to save those. These were the trees that we felt were were substantial enough in size and healthy enough that had value that we wanted to try to preserve. Every year we lose some, roughly 10, 12%, maybe 20. <laughs> <laughs> this spring we're planting 225 trees. And again, like I mentioned, we're finally shifting towards from removal to actually planting. And you can see by the graph in front of you on your screens that the trend is moving in the right direction. Ultimately, we want to be planting more trees than we're removing. Because what we've been having is we've had a net loss instead of a net gain. So Area 5, Evergreen Park, I'm going to shift to Parks Capital now. Area 5, Evergreen Park, we're looking at some improvements in this area. As you can see in the next slide, this will show you where it is. It's kind of its isolated area. It's not part of the main drive. It has its own entrance north of the, the Pigeon River Bridge. It has its own drive and it own, its own parking area. The area in yellow here, we have a, a grant through uh, the, the Natural Resources Damage, Damage, Damage Assessment, NARDA. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jack. So we're, we got a grant to replace. There's a footbridge right where my the, the cursor, well, maybe my cursor isn't showing. It, it, you can see it just north of this area. The yellow area is actually where the new bridge is going to be going in. And once that, that should be going in later, they, later this summer. Along with that, once that bridge is in, we're, we want to enhance this area and improve it. it it's, 
It needs a little work with the, the drive. Uh, as you can see, the shelter is old, um, rustic, we like to call it. Uh, but we want to make sure it's, it's, it's still usable and friendly and, and, and inviting. And the playground is uh, old, needs to be upgraded, especially with today's uh, playground safety standards. This is a walkway. Once the bridge gets in, the, the NARDA grant is just paying for the bridge. We still have to get a, a walkway and approach to it and, and do some work as well. It's just another view of the shelter. So we can say rustic. We'll, we'll call it rustic. Here's the current bridge. Uh, it's, it's time. It needs, as you can see, uh, it's, it's old. Um, and what, what, what's limiting is is... is we can't really drive equipment across it for another access point. You can see some of the, the erosion and the asphalt uh, approach here that's kind of sloughing off towards, towards the river. So overall, looking at these improvements, you can see this is kind of just a real quick summary and breakdown of what we've done in engineering. You know, looking at the asphalt removal concrete repair the lawn restoration and, and shelters upgrading. So that's one of our, 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 our main park projects for 2022. Also on your list that we, I'm not, don't have, don't have necessarily a PowerPoint for you this evening is, you'll see in the, in the capital improvements plan, roughly a quarter million dollars between parks and, parks and forestry and the next year it goes to facilities. And what it, what it is is this ADA improvements. We did a citywide ADA assessment for accessibility for Americas with Disabilities Act. And what that roughly shows out of the entire city, there's roughly around $2 million of improvements that are needed. And that goes from anything from a park restroom uh, a park, uh, just access from the parking lot to the playground, to anything with a building. Now, City Hall, recently renovated, we're good here, but we have other facilities. The service building has ADA issues. Uh, the, um, some, the chief mentioned the fire station. So facilities overall, uh, we're, we're gonna be concentrating and making sure that the, the the ADA improvements are, are taken care of as well. So that's a separate program. Again, that's an ongoing annual program for the next five years to address those concerns. And it alternates, as I mentioned. Some of it goes to the parks for one year, and then the next year we, we concentrate on our facilities. So it, it will alternate. Next in the spreadsheet, we're going to talk about wastewater. Wastewater treatment plant. And I'm just gonna pull that up mm -hmm. here real short. <laughs> oh, I had it up already. My apologies. So the wastewater treatment plant, and Steve Jossard, I failed to mention, uh, since he's remote this evening, I apologize, Steve, I hope you're still on the line. But I'm gonna bring up a zoom, an aerial of the plant. Every day we treat approximately 12 million gallons of sewage at this facility. So that's the plant. One of the big projects, however, is we got to get the sewage to the plant. And that's in our sanitary sewer system. And one of the big projects that we're faced with later this year and next year is our South Shore Interceptor Sewer. This is roughly Indiana Avenue to the north on this bridge, on this, on this map roughly all along the lakeshore, almost two miles, a little over 8,000 feet. 
There's a major 60 inch diameter concrete sanitary sewer pipe that serves roughly about 50% of that flow that goes to the plant. It serves a portion of the town of Sheboygan's sewage as well, not only just the city. That, that line runs right along the lakeshore. Very important, it was built in 1930s. We inspected it. It's in amazing good condition. A testament to how the quality of the work that was done back in the day, it was built to, to last. But it wasn't built with the lake levels as high as they are in terms of the erosion. And so what we need to do is provide protection and enhancement to ensure that that facility and that pipeline will remain in place. So we're, we're looking at roughly an $8 million project. It's in the program. Now, this is all not all funded through capital improvements. There's some of it that's going to be funded through federal grants, as well as this comes through the wastewater sewage rates. So it doesn't necessarily hit the, the general obligation borrowing or the general fund, as Administrator Wolf has explained earlier. This has its own separate source of funding through the wastewater rates. There's some, we have money set aside within the wastewater treatment plant and its funding, as well as those grants as I mentioned. So uh, looking forward to advancing this, you'll probably be hearing this project quite a bit as it further advances in, in the future, but it'll be a very important project. It's under design as we speak, but I wanted to bring that to your attention before I, I um, moved on to the plant. So the plant, as you can see, these square kind of circular areas here, these are what we call the clarifiers. So the sewage comes into the plant, it gets screened, gets pumped into these clarifiers. Sewage is retained in there and circular um, arms as well as flow. Uh, settle the solids to the bottom and move to the sewage through the plant, through what are these square areas? There's some biological nutrient removal as well as aeration to add oxygen to the sewage. And then final clarification, which further settles any impurities out. Then these squiggly lines that are like a maze, that's our chlorine disinfectant contact chambers. And ultimately, all of this sewage and the water, once it's cleaned, gets discharged back into Lake Michigan. What the project we're looking at is these in these basins, there's big drives, motor drives, gear drives. They need to be upgraded and replaced. And so what you see in your, in your program is, you know, we're looking at doing, we're, we're systematically doing one every other year. So we're doing a, pri there's four of them. So we're doing drive number three for the primary this year. Then we're doing secondary drive number one in the next year. Talked about also at the plant, there's some screening and, and scum removal. There's, there's an, uh, an auger that takes out the solids, as mentioned, in the non-organic material um, that gets flushed. Anything that's, uh, that doesn't degrade naturally, it gets screened and ejected into a dumpster and it gets taken to uh, a landfill. Right now, we only have one, one unit that actually uh, screens that and, and actually grinds it to a to a to a smaller um, diameter, not diameter, but smaller smaller particle size, so it's easily ejected. What we're looking at doing is we're adding a second train for redundancy and backup. Right now, if that goes down, we have to shut that down, and it's and it makes cleaning and screening that much more difficult. So that that project is is also scheduled. Lastly, lastly, I just want to show you also we have in, in, this, in the budget, the sewer truck. We have a, a it, this would be, an, this is an example of what a new sewer truck is. What, what it does is 
we have these high pressure hoses, they go down into the sewer lines, they high pressure flush from the inside of the pipe, keep the sewers clean, keep the greases, any debris that's in there, keep some free flowing. We, we, we have a systematic crew that has a truck like this that's um, beyond its useful life. Again, this is funded through when your sewer bill. So when you're paying your sewer, when you pay your water and sewer bill, that goes into a fund. This fund then helps replace these types of projects. So this truck would be, it's used every day. We have, a, it's called route jetting. We send a crew out. This is your area. These are trouble areas. Go out and clean these areas to keep, keep the sewers flowing and, and prevent backups. So that would be your route. I'm gonna move on now to the motor vehicle division. If anyone, if, if I should say, ask if anyone's got questions. Any questions regarding wastewater? All right, go to motor vehicles then. Motor vehicles should be fairly, fairly, Simple this evening. As City Administrator Wolf mentioned before, we are looking at moving towards uh, a lease program for much of our small, what I would say our small fleet, which would be our pickup trucks, anything less than what we call a one ton vehicle. We have a roughly around 50 of those types of vehicles in the DPW fleet. And so we're looking at, and, and quite frankly, those, those would compete against some of what I would say are larger more specialized equipment. And it was probably a part of the fleet because of that com competition got neglected. It didn't get replaced often. And uh, so you would see the pickup trucks year after year. We have some trucks approaching 20 years in, in service. Uh, not the best for safety, reliability, as well as fuel efficiencies. So that's an exciting program. We're gonna be looking forward to advance later this year as well. So really the only thing we have next year is two mm -hmm. items. We're looking at a new street sweeper. The one other, we're, and, and we have three. So the, we have a 2010 Schwartz A7000. Uh, it's re reaching the end of its lifespan. And the one on the right is what we're replacing it with. The, this is a Timco unit 600. And actually we, we did a replacement this year for 2021. And that's what you see in front of you. So in 2022, we're gonna do the next unit and there'll be one in the future again to finalize the three. These are used every day, except during the winter time. So they're out sweeping the city streets. And on average, we're roughly right around 700 tons of material that we'll pick up on the streets just from sweeping. The other thing we're looking to replace is a, called a skid steer. It's a little Bobcat that is the, the brand name. Uh, the current one is a 2006 unit. It's used all over the place, landscaping, construction, snow removal. They, they're very versatile. They have met multiple attachments you can put on. You can put on a snow blower. You can put on a broom. You can put on a grinder, for instance, in, in some cases. So this would be the other unit that we're replacing. And uh, because of the pickup trucks and the lease program, these are really the only two pieces of equipment that we're requesting for 2022. Awesome. Any questions for David regarding the uh, motor vehicle division? Older or administrator Wolf, sorry. That's okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to point out um, a piece that I probably should have explained in the very beginning of the presentation. Uh, as the department heads were going through the uh, project. But if you go into your, um, into your book and you look at the Excel sheets that Director Beeble was referencing, the very first page, which is page 17 of 211, uh, please note that uh, this is color coded. So yellow is previously approved in same year and then blue is previously approved in a different year. But what I wanted you to focus on is the revenues. So there's, when we talk about geo, geo um, debt funding and tax levy, there are different areas where we get our funding from. Um, 
obviously donations doesn't look so hot, but uh, it's hard to donate to the city. But it, as you go through it, you'll notice that in 2022, we're looking at $40 million worth of, of total revenue spending, but then we're asking for this committee to uh, recommend 23 through 26, and you'll be able to walk yourself through it. So as you're going through, you'll actually be able to see where where that uh, the funding is coming, whether it's tax levy or geo debt uh, borrowing. Um, again, this is this collaboration is allowing us to maintain our two million dollar geo debt borrowing and use other funds um, to to achieve this this plan of 2022 executive. Thank you. Thanks, Minister Roll. Appreciate it. David, you're good. All right. I'm all right, um, thank you uh, department heads for those presentations. Um, any questions from committee members at all for any topics discussed tonight? Commissioner Mayor? Uh, Alder Perella. Yeah, I was just wondering, first of all, I want to thank the, the um, Project, heads of department. Can you pull your mic down? Oh, no, just pull it, pull it closer to you. When it's red, you're ready. And you can bend it down. There you go. I just want to thank the, the heads of the departments because for, uh, for uh, a new uh, other person, this is a fantastic best opportunity to get to know you and, uh, and I appreciated very much all the presentations. In fact, I was also wondering if uh, those presentations can be shared or you plan to share those presentations with us. We can get you that information. Sure. I, I mean, at least from Public Works, I can, I can, I could send a PDF of these, or, or I could, if you prefer a printed version, we can do send the printed version, or uh, as an email, or we could again share it as an actual PowerPoint. Either, either way, we'll we'll be able to get it to you in a format that you'll be able to have it and and be able to take some more time to review it on your leisure. I would appreciate that. All right. Other questions from anyone? Okay. I don't know if we're taking action. Do we need to, if anyone knows what the formal motion is, just to accept um, the RO, and then we're meeting next Monday as well. So is there a motion to accept the RO? No, you don't need to do that. It's just okay. a review. Of just a review. All yeah. right. Sounds so good. The next meeting date is? May 3rd, next Monday. Seeing that we've exhausted the agenda, is there a motion to adjourn? There's been a motion and second. All those in favor of adjourning, please state aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Chair votes aye. We're adjourned. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you.